the first chapter india size and location we have to go through these four topics in the chapter india's location india's size india and the world and india's neighbors so introduction india is one of the oldest civilizations and have a remarkable history after independence from the british rule in 1947 India achieved multifaceted socio-economic progress. It also made a remarkable progress in the field of agriculture, industry, technology, and overall economic development. So, India's location. You can see that Earth globe, the horizontal dotted line from the center, is nothing but equator, and the vertical dotted line from the center. is 0 degree longitude which is known as greenwich meridian so you can see the seven continents from the left north america south america africa europe asia australia and antarctica and in the yellow color we can see our india so india lies entirely in the northern hemisphere between the latitudes 8 degree 4 minutes north and 37 degree 6 minutes north and the longitudes 68 degree 7 minutes east and 97 degree 25 minutes east india is divided by tropic of cancer that is 23 and half or 23 degree 30 minutes north in almost two equal parts in southeast in the bay of bengal the andaman and nicobar islands are there and in the southwest lakshadweep islands the lakshadweep islands lie in the arabian sea so india size the total area of india is 3.28 million square kilometers which is 2.4% of the total area of the world friends it is just 2.4% of the total area of world but the population in india is nearly about 17% of the population of world so you can understand how much load india is carrying on the left side you can see that graph so that six countries have more size than india they are russia canada usa china brazil australia and they are number 7th that is india India is the seventh largest country in the world. It has land boundary of about fifteen thousand and two hundred kilometers, and the total length of the coastline of the mainland, including the Andaman and Nicobar and Lakshadweep Islands, is seven thousand five hundred sixteen point six kilometers. In the northwest, north, and northeast of the India, young fold mountains, that is Himalaya, bound it. The south about. 22 degree north latitude india narrows and finally extends towards the indian ocean so that part is known as peninsula and this peninsula of india divides it into the two seas the arabian sea to the west and the bay of bengal on its east india's east west extent appears to be smaller than the north south extent from that adjacent figure from the adjacent map we can see that the distance from west to east that is from gujarat to arunachal pradesh is 2933 km whereas the distance from kashmir to kanyakumari means north to south is 3214 km so that the extent of extent of north to south is greater than the extent of west to east the time along the standard meridian the dotted line the dotted vertical line you can see it is nothing but the 82 degree 30 minutes east passing through the mirzapur in uttar pradesh is taken as the ist for whole country the time gap between the arunachal pradesh present in the east and the gujarat present in the west is about 2 hours the latitude and extent influence the duration of day and the night as one moves from south to north okay so there is extra extra stuff for you in between consecutive two uh, longitudes 
1 degree accounts for 4 minutes. So there is a difference of 30 degrees in Arunachal Pradesh and Gujarat. So 30 degree difference will account for in minutes as 30 degree into 4. It will give us 120 minutes means nearly 2 hours. India and the world. India is located in the center of world between East and West Asia. You can see that the West Asian countries like Saudi Arab, Yemen, Oman, Iran, Syria are on the west. Whereas on the east, there are some countries present over there. Uh, there is a trick for the four countries to the east of India. It is nothing but MCTV. MCTV. It means Myanmar, Cambodia, Thailand and Vietnam. It is not in the order, but that four countries are there. India is located in the center, we all know. The routes across the Indian Ocean which connect the countries of Europe and in the west and the countries of East Asia provide a strategic central location to India. The Deccan Peninsula helps India to establish a close contact with West Asia, Africa and Europe from the western coast and the southeast and East Asia from the eastern coast. Because in the south, all on the three sides, there is a, there are seas and oceans for India. So latest uh, quote uh, used by PM Modi is that ये सागर हमें दुनिया से अलग नहीं करते हैं, बल्कि ये सागर हमें दूसरी दुनिया से जोड़ते हैं. The ocean which is south of the India given the name of as Indian Ocean, as no other country has a long coastline on the Indian Ocean as India has. But there are emerging tensions in the Indian Ocean due to the increase of actions by the China in the Indian Ocean. And China keeps saying like this that Indian Ocean is not India's ocean. The land routes of India are much older than the sea route. We all know the sea routes are developed much later than the land routes. All the travelers in the ancient India were coming where came from land routes. Various processes across various passes across the mountains in the north have provided passages to the ancient travelers as oceans limited such interaction for a long time. We all know that the first person to come to India through ocean route was the Vasco da Gama. He was a Portuguese. He came in the 1498 at the coast of Malabar in the Cochin. And he was welcomed by the local ruler known as Zamorin. The land routes help India in the exchange of ideas and commodities since ancient times. India have propagated the ideas of Upanishads and the Ramayana, the story of Panchatantra, the Indian numerals and the decimal system, as well as given the spices, muslin, muslin is nothing but the fiber and the other merchandise to different countries. Also the influence of Greek sculpture and the architectural style of dome and minarets from West Asia can be seen in the different parts of India. So coming back on India's neighbors, the last topic of the chapter. India is comprised of 29 states and 7 union territories and share its land boundary with. In the northwest direction, India shares its land boundary with Pakistan and Afghanistan. In the north, the boundary is with China, Nepal and Bhutan. In the east, there are two countries, Myanmar and Bangladesh. And in the south, there is Sri Lanka and Maldives. The Sri Lanka is separated from India by a narrow channel of sea that is formed by the Park Strait and the Gulf of Mannar, while the Maldives Islands are situated to the south of Lakshadweep Islands in the Arabian Sea. So let us see, do you know from this chapter? The southernmost point of Indian Ocean, Indian Union, that is Indira Point, got submerged under the sea water in 2004 during the tsunami. Since the opening of Suez Canal in 1869, India's distance from Europe has been reduced by 7,000 kilometers. In the sorry guys, in the ancient times means not in the ancient times, it is in the medieval time, 
when uh, Vasco da Gama visited India. He came uh, from Cape of Good Hope, that is the southern, uh, southernmost point of Africa continent, to the India. But due to the opening of Suez Canal, the Europeans decreased their distance as 7,000 kilometers. So they entered directly into the Mediterranean Sea from the Europe. Then via Suez Canal, they entered into the Red Sea. Then through the Gulf of Aden, they came to Arabian Sea and directly to the India. So their trading increased. Before 1947, that means before independence, there were two types of states in the India. The provinces and the princely states. Provinces were ruled directly by the British officials who were appointed by the Viceroy. And the princely states were ruled by the local hereditary rulers who acknowledged the sovereignty in return for local autonomy. So, chapter number 2. Physical features of India. Friends, this is the part 1 of the chapter because the chapter is uh, large. I have divided into the two videos. So this is the part one of this chapter. So in these chapters, I will be covering introduction. The major physiographic divisions of India will be covered in the next part. So introduction. We all know India is a vast country with varied landforms, which has all major physical features of the earth. That is mountains. For example, we have Himalayas. We have Aravalli mountain, we have Vindya, Satpuda, we have Western Ghats, Eastern Ghats, etc. We have plains, we have desert, that means Thar desert spread over the Rajasthan. We have the plateaus, for example, Deccan plateau and islands. In the first chapter, we saw that Andaman and Nicobar Islands as well as the Lakshadweep Islands. Andaman and Nicobar Islands are in Bay of Bengal, whereas Lakshadweep Islands are in Arabian Sea. So, how these physical features have been formed? There are some theories behind the formation of these physical features. One th such theory, which is more acceptable, is the theory of plate tectonics. So, let us see the theory of plate tectonics. This theory explains the upper part of Earth, which is called as crust. It is divided into the seven major and some minor plates called as tectonic plates. In the adjacent figure, you can see that there are nearly 10 plates. 7 plates are major while the 3 remaining plates are minor plates. The 7 major plates are first passive plate, second is North American plate, third is South American plate, fourth is African plate, fifth is Antarctica plate, sixth, sixth is Indian Australian plate, seventh is Eurasian plate. And the minor plates are Caribbean plate, Nazca plate and Philippines plate. The movement of these plates built up stresses within the plates and also the continental rocks above which results in faulting, folding and volcanic activities and thus the landforms are formed. These movements are classified into the three types conversion, diversion and transform boundary. So let us see conversion boundary. The meaning of conversion is nothing to come together. When some plates come towards each other, from converge, they form conversion boundary. This conversion boundary may lead either collide and crumble or one may slide under the order. In the first figure, you can see that the conversion boundary. Both the plates are moving towards each other. Second is diversion boundary. When some plates move away from each other, it is opposite of the conversion boundary. It forms the diversion boundary. In the second figure, the plates are moving away from each other. It will be called as diversion boundary. And the third, that is transform boundary. When some plates move horizontally past each other, and thus they form transform boundary. In the figure number three. So there were two lines, but uh, important is Gondwana line. So what is Gondwana line? You can see in the figure. The South America, Africa, Arabia, India, Antarctica, Australia, these plates were united and they were the part of Gondwana. There was a time when India, Australia, South Africa, South America and Antarctica were on one single landmass known as the Gondwana land. It was the southern part of the supercontinent Pangaea. 
and the northern part was known as Angara Nai. So we were the part of Gondwana Nai. We can see from the figure that Africa remains as, as it is. South America moved towards west. Antarctica moved towards the south. Arabia and India moved towards northeast direction, whereas the Australia moved towards the eastern direction. So the formation of Himalayas. The earth crust was divided into a number of pieces by convection currents. In the Australian plate, separated from the Gondwana land and drifted towards the north, which resulted in the collision of the plate with the much larger Eurasian plate. Means in the north there was much larger Eurasian plate, and from the south, the, uh, south and west direction, the Indian plate collided over that Eurasian plate. Due to this collision, the sedimentary rocks which were accumulated in the geosyncline, the geosyncline nothing but a submerged body of water, and that was known as Tethys Sea. And that Tethys Sea were folded, which resulted in the formation of mountain system. That is the folded mountain system of Western Asia and Himalaya. You can see that the there are mountain ranges. For example, Himalayas on the north, there is a Pamir knot. Through that knot, there are two chains are going. One is the Kundun mountain going to the China, or there is a Hindu Kush mountain going to the Pakistan and Afghanistan. So the formation of northern plains. You can see in the adjacent map, the northern plains are extended on a very large area of northern part of India. The states are uh, includes Rajasthan, Punjab, Haryana, UP, Bihar, part of West Bengal, Assam, and some part of Meghalaya. The upliftment of Himalaya from Tethys Sea and Seti, settling of the northern flank of the peninsula plateau created a large basin. In due time, gradually the basin was filled with the deposition of sediments by the river flowing from the mountains. We know, we know that there are perennial mountains that originate through the Himalayas and they carry large amount of sediments and seeds and that sediments got deposited over these northern plains. The rivers flowing from the mountains in the north and the peninsular plateau in the south. Those created a flat land of extensive alluvial deposits known as northern plains of India. The soil found, soil found over there is alluvial soil. The Himalayan mountain form an unstable zone at as it has a very youthful topography, we all know it is a young folded mountain. It has a high peaks. Some peaks are more than 8,000 meters of height. It also has deep valleys and the fast flowing rivers. And those rivers are perennial, means they have water for all the 12 months in the year. In this video, I will cover the major physiographic divisions of India. So let's start the video. The first physiographic division of India, the Himalayan mountains. In the map, you can see on the north side of India, Himalayan mountains are there. It is geologically young and structurally folded mountains, which run along the northern borders of India. We can see the Himalayan mountains are in the states like JNK, Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, Sikkim, and Arunachal Pradesh. The range in, of the west is from Indus. The Indus is known as Sindhu. And to the east direction, it is up to the Brahmaputra river. It covers a distance of about 2400 kilometers, represented, representing the loftiest peak in the world. Width varies from 400 kilometers in the Kashmir, means in the west Himalaya to the 150 kilometers in the Himalayan Pradesh, means in the eastern Himalayas. The altitude, which means height, the altitude variations is greater in the eastern half than those in the western half. So the divisions of Himalaya, the divisions of Himalayas are based on two factors. The first factor is longitudinal division. The second is west to east division. In longitudinal division, the longitudinal division means the divisions in north to south. There are three parts. The great or inner Himalayas or the Himadri. The lesser Himalaya or Himachal and the Shivaliks. In west to east divisions, those are demarcated by the river boundaries. 
फर्स्ट इज पंजाब हिमालयास सेकंड इज कुमाउन हिमालयास थर्ड इज नेपाल हिमालयास फोर्थ इज आसाम हिमालयास एंड द लास्ट फिफ्थ इज द पूर्वांचल सो द फर्स्ट पार्ट ऑफ डिविजन दैट मीन्स लॉन्जिट्यूडल डिविजन ऑफ हिमालयास इन इट द फर्स्ट द ग्रेट और इनर और द हिमाथ्रीज इट इज द नॉर्दन मोस्ट रेंज एंड मोस्ट कंटिन्यूअस रेंज कंसिस्टिंग ऑफ द लॉप्टीएस्ट पीक्स With an average height of more than six thousand meters, it contains all the famous peaks. The basic part of this Himalaya is composed of granite rock. It is perennially snowbound, means there is snow for all the twelve months of year, and the number of glaciers descend from this ridge. Second is the Lesser Himalaya or Himachal Himalaya. It lies south of the Himadri and forms the most rugged mountain system. The height varies between 3,700 to 4,100 meters. Means the height of Himachal is less than the height of Himadri, and the average width is 50 kilometers. Longest and most important ranges are Pir Panjal Range, the Dhauladhar Range, and the Mahabharat Ranges. The famous valley of this range are the Kashmir, the Kangra, and the Kulu Valley in Himachal Pradesh. Also, this range is famous for hill station. We all know the hill station like Kulu Manali. Those are located in the Lesser Himalayas. The third part that means the Shivali. This is the outermost range or the southernmost range of Himalaya. It extends over a width of 10 to 50 km and has a height varying between 900 to 1100 meters. It is composed of unconsolidated sediments brought down by the rivers from the main Himalayan ranges. The second kind of division is west to east division of Himalayas. The first, Punjab Himalayas, the part of Himalayas lying between Indus and Satluj, they form the Punjab Himalayas. From west to east, respectively, they are regionally known as Kashmir and Himachal Himalayas. Second, Kumau Himalayas, the part of Himalayas lying between the Satluj and Kali, those are known as Kumau Himalayas. Third is Nepal Himalayas, the part lying between Kali River and Tista River. Is known as Nepal Himalayas, Assam Himalayas. Assam Himalayas lie between the rivers Tista and Dihang. The fifth, that means the last, the Purvanchal are eastern hills and the mountains. The mountain ranges of eastern India. These are marked by the Brahmaputra River. The Himalayas bend sharply to the south and spread along the eastern border of India after the Dihang Gorge. These hills running through the north eastern states. we call them as a seven sisters arunachal pradesh nagaland manipur mizoram tripura and eastern assam states and are mostly composed of strong sandstones which are sedimentary rocks the hills are covered with dense forest it comprises the patkai hills the naga hills the manipur hills and the mizo hills so before going to the second phase of the division of india and i will advise you to look at the map of the india that means the physical map and see the all the reliefs i will explain for you the first physiographic division was the himalayan mountains we are we have covered now so look at the himalayan mountains on the northern side of the map you can see that it is in the states like j and k then himachal pradesh then uttarakhand sikkim and then arunachal pradesh and some parts means the purvanchal goes into the nagaland manipur mizoram some parts of tripura and the eastern assam second division is the northern plains look this the middle section the northern plains given by the number 2 the states are up bihar west bengal punjab haryana parts of rajasthan part of assam the third is the peninsular plateau means the tapering portion of the south india means it is uh, comprised of two parts central highlands and deccan plateau the fourth is the indian desert we all know the desert is thar desert which is in rajasthan given by the number 4 the coastal plains so india has two coast on the western side one on the eastern side the area between western ghats and the arabian sea are the western coast whereas the area between the eastern ghats and Bay of Bengal are the eastern coast. The islands. We know that India has two kinds of two island groups. 
one is in bay of bengal that is known as andaman nicobar other one is in arabian sea that is known as lakshadweep we have discussed it in the chapter number 1 so coming back over here the second physiographic division is the northern plains the northern plains has been formed by the interplay of three major river systems which are those three river systems the indus the ganga and the brahmaputra those three are himalayan river system they are perennial along with their tributaries it is form of alluvial soil the vast basin lying at the foothills of himalaya is deposited with the alluvium alluvium nothing but the fine particles of silt and clay that is very useful for farming area of the northern plain is 7 lakh square kilometers the length of northern plain is 2400 km whereas the breadth of northern plain is 240 320 km this plain having the fertile land and adequate water supply hence it is a densely populated region it is agriculturally very productive region of india due to rich soil cover combined with the adequate water supply and favorable climate the rivers coming from northern mountains water huge amount of eroded soil which is known as silt which help in the depositional work in the lower course due to gentle slope the velocity of river decreases which results in the formation of river and islands and islands formed by the river also in lower course rivers split into the numeral cha numeral channels due to the deposition of silt known as distributaries friends there is difference between distributaries and the tributaries the tributary are small water channels they merge into the a big water channel called as a big river whereas the distributary are formed in the big water channel due to the deposition of silt and we can see the structures like deltas the northern plain is broadly divided into three parts punjab plains ganga plains and brahmaputra plains the western part is punjab plains the western part of the northern plain formed by the indus and its tributaries the larger part of this plain lies in pakistan we know that our neighbor pakistan shares a area called as punjab with india india has 45% of punjab whereas pakistan has 55% of punjab so this area formed by the indus and its tributaries the tributaries of indus are nothing but china china jhelum ravi bias and satluj the ganga plains it extends between the bhagger and the tista rivers it spread over the states of north india haryana delhi up bihar partly jharkhand and the west bengal the third that means the brahmaputra plains it lies in the east of ganga plain particularly in the assam so this is the image of the northern plains uh, the division of the northern plains on the basis of variations of relief features that image is uh, not very clear but you can it will help to understand so there are four regions on the basis of relief features first is bhagar second is tarai third is bhangar fourth is khagar so just consider the himalaya that is this part is the shivali that means the southern most range at the foothills of this range there is a part called as bhagar you can see the big stones like structure at the south of the bhagar in the lower portion there is a area called as tarai at the lower course of tarai there is a bhangar and at the river valley very near to river valley there is a part called as khagar then let's see them one by one bhagar bhagar lying at the foot of shivali that is the southern most range of himalaya it is a narrow 8 to 16 km wide belt of tables second part tarai it lies next to bhagar it is a wet and marshy area with wildlife and forest friends at the border of india and nepal the major part lying there is tarai bhangar it is a older aluminum plain which rises above the level of flood plains and the khagar it is a younger aluminum of the flood plains means the soil of the khagar gets renewed every year after the floods hence in between khagar and bhangar the khagar is more fertile than bhangar khagar is younger whereas bhangar is older the third main physiographic division of india is the peninsular plateau 
The peninsula plateau is table land that is composed of old crystalline igneous and metamorphic rocks. The plateau consists of two broad divisions. First is central highlands and second is the Deccan plateau. Let us see the central highlands. It lies to the north of the Narmada river covering a major area of Malwa plateau. The Vindan range is bounded by the central highlands on the south and the Arauli on the northwest. The further westward ex extension gradually merges with the sandy and rocky desert of Rajasthan, means in the western India. Rivers in this area are Chambal, Sindh and Sindh, Betwa and K. Most of these rivers are originated in Madhya Pradesh state of India. The central highlands are wider in the west but narrower in the east. The eastward extension of this plateau are locally known as Bundelkhand and Bagelkhand. The Chota Nagpur plateau marks the further eastward extension drained by the river called as Damodar. The second part of peninsula plateau is the Deccan plateau. It lies southward of the central highlands. It is a triangular landmass that lies to the south of river Narmada. The Satpura range beyond its broad bound its broad base in the north, while the Mahadev and the Kaimur and the Michael range form its eastern extensions. It is higher in the west and slopes gently eastward. Means the rivers flowing over the Deccan plateau, most of the rivers flow towards the eastern side because it slopes gently towards eastern direction. Three prominent hill ranges from the west to east are Garo, Kasia and Jaintia. A distinct feature of the peninsula plateau is the black soil area known as Deccan Trap. This black soil is also known as Regur soil and it is very useful for the production of cotton. So let us see the difference between Eastern and Western Ghats. The first point, the Eastern Ghats are formed by the Eastern edge of Deccan Plateau, whereas the Western Ghats are formed by Western edge of Deccan Plateau. Second point, the Eastern Ghats are irregular and cut apart by the rivers falling into the Bay of Bengal. On the other hand, the western ghats are continuous and they can be crossed only through the passes. Third point, Mahanadi, Godavari, Krishna, Kaviri, etc. rivers flow in this region, whereas Narvada, Tapi, Sabarmati and Mai rivers flow in the western ghats region. Fourth point, Mahindragiri with an altitude of 1501 meters is the highest peak of eastern ghats, whereas the highest peak of western ghats is Anaimudi, which has a height of 2695 meters. Last point. The, the eastern guards consist of eastern coastal plains. Means the plains between eastern guards and Bay of Bengal. Whereas the western guards, guards con constitute the western coastal plains. Means the plains between Arabian Sea and western guards. The fourth major physiographic division of India is the Indian desert. And we all know the desert is present in Rajasthan. It is known as Thar Desert. The Indian Desert lies towards the western margin of Araudi Hills. It is a land of undulating topography, means it is an uneven area covered with the sand dunes, means there are elevation and depressions of sands. This region receives very low rainfall, below 150 mm per year. Hence, it has an arid climate with a low vegetation cover. There is only river, means there is only large river in this region that is called as Luni. The Barkhans, that means crescent shaped dunes, that is a landform of the desert, covers larger areas but the longitudinal dunes become more prominent near the Indo-Pakistan boundaries. If you visit Jaisalmer, that is on the India-Pakistan boundary, you will uh, get to see that the longitudinal dunes of desert. That is the prominent landform that is created by desert. The next means the fifth major geographic zone of the India is the coastal plains. The coastal plains are of two types. One is the western coastal plain, other is the eastern coastal plain. The narrow coastal strips flank the peninsular plateau running along the Arabian Sea on the west and the Bay of Bengal on the east. The western coastal plains consist of 
three sections. You can see here the western coastal plains are given. They are uh, starting from Gujarat and at the end up to the Kerala. The northern part of coast is known as Kokan. It is from Mumbai to Goa, particularly in Maharashtra. The central stretch is called as the Kannada plain. That is along the area of coast of Karnataka. The third and the south southern stage is known as the Malabar coast, means the coast of Kerala. The plains along the Bay of Bengal are wide and level. The northern part is known as Northern Sarkar, means in Odisha and part of Andhra Pradesh. While the southern part is known as the Koromandal coast, means in Tamil Nadu. The large rivers are the Mahanadi, Godavari and Krishna and the Kaveri. They have formed the extensive delta on the eastern coast. The Lake Chilika is an important feature along the eastern coast. Friends, this Lake Chilika is in the state of Odisha. And it is the largest brackish water lake in India. Brackish water lake means salt water lake. The last major physiographic division of India is the islands. The Lakshadweep island group in the Arabian Sea is close to Kerala. This group of islands is composed of small coral islands. The Lakshadweep islands were earlier known as Lakadu, Minikoy and Amindu. It covers very small area of 32 square kilometers. The Kavratti island is the administrative headquarters of Lakshadweep. The Pitti island which is inhabited as a bird sanctuary. The second island group, the Andaman and Nicobar islands are an elongated chain of islands located in the Bay of Bengal. They are bigger in size and are more numerous and scattered. The entire group of islands is divided into two broad categories. Means first category is Andaman and second in the south that is Nicobar. These islands are the elevated portion of submarine mountains. In the first chapter we have seen that the Arakan Yuma range. Means uh, I remember I, had, I think I told this. The Andaman Nicobar islands are the southern extension of Arakan Yuma range which is in Myanmar and those are the submerged mountains. So the islands are the peaks of that submerged mountains. So let us see the do you know from this chapter. First point, Majuli in the Brahmaputra river is the largest inhabited river in Ireland in the world. Means in the total world. I think Majuli is in Assam. Yes. And uh, it has declared as a separate district in the Assam. Doha is made up of two words. Do and Ab. Do means two and Ab means water. Similarly, Punjab is also made up of two words. Punj meaning five and Ab meaning water. Means the land of five rivers. The Chilka Lake is the largest salt water lake in India. It lies in the state of Orissa to the south of Manali Delta. We have already discussed this point. The fourth point. India's only active volcano is found on the barren island in the Andaman and Nicobar group of islands. Those lie in the Bay of Bengal. Third chapter, drainage. The topics in the chapter. Introduction of drainage, drainage systems in India, drainage patterns, the Himalayan rivers, the peninsular rivers, lakes, role of rivers in the economy and river pollution. In this part first, I am going to cover the first four topics. That is drainage, its systems, its patterns and the Himalayan rivers. So, introduction. The drainage describes river system of the particular area. The area drained by a single river system is called as a drainage basin. Any upland or a mountain separating the two adjoining drainage basins is known as water divide. So, in the adjacent figure, you can see that there are two water basins, river, sorry, river basins. One is stream one, stream A, second is stream B. And the up Highland between those stream A and stream B is acting as a water divide. For example, the water divided water divide between Narmada and Tapi is nothing but Satpura mountain because it divides both river basins. The drainage systems in India. The Indian rivers are divided into two major groups: the Himalayan river system and the peninsular rivers. Instead of going point by point, I have uploaded the image of difference between Himalayan rivers and peninsular rivers. So let's see. 
Himalayan rivers are perennial in nature, means they carry water for all the 12 months in a year, in the year. Whereas the peninsula rivers are seasonal, they dry up in summers and they are dependent upon the rainfall. Second point, these rivers, means the Himalayan rivers, cause much erosion and have great flow of water. Whereas the peninsula rivers create much less erosion and also have weaker flow of water because they are carrying water for only 4 to 8 months. Third point, the Himalayan rivers are meandering, means they take turns and form the landforms. The peninsula rivers are straight. Fourth point, the Himalayan rivers originate in the Himalayas, whereas the peninsula rivers originate in the small hills and plateaus. Fifth point, the Himalayan rivers irrigate the northern plains, whereas the peninsula rivers irrigate the Deccan plateau. Sixth point, the Himalayan river the basins of Himalayan rivers are very fertile. In the last lecture, we saw that the alluvium deposits due to the Himalayan rivers. Those alluvium contains silt and clay, which is very fertile. Sixth point in peninsular rivers is that peninsular river basins are not so very fertile. Seventh point, the Himalayan rivers cover a very long distance because they are big rivers and long as well. Whereas the peninsular rivers cover a shorter distance as compared to Himalayan rivers. Last point, the examples of Himalayan rivers are Ganga, the Indus and the Brahmaputra. Whereas the example of peninsular rivers are Narmada, Tapi, Mahanadi, Godavari, Krishna and Kaveri. So let's see the drainage patterns. The streams within a drainage basin form certain patterns. That depends upon the slope of the land, underlying rock structure as well as the climatic conditions of that particular area. So there are four kinds of drainage patterns. You can see in the adjacent figure or the image. First is dendritic system or dendritic pattern. Second one is rectangular. Third one is radial having the same mountain in the center. And last one is the trellis. So before going to see Himalayan rivers, I would like to present you this map because someone has said iska karne ka maza hai, iska ke izar mein. So I would like to add geography pannne ka maza hai map ke saath mein. So look carefully into the map. Near Jammu and Kashmir, at the west of Jammu and Kashmir, you will see the 5 to 6 rivers. That area or that river system is known as Indus River System. In the water treaty, Indus Water Treaty of 1960, between the two friendly countries, yes, you can get it, between India and Pakistan, those time it was brokered by World Bank, the father of all banks, the mother of all banks, Chacha Chacha of all banks, yes. The three top rivers in the north, the, you can memorize them as CJI, means Chinab, Jalaman, Indus, from south to north, were given to Pakistan, whereas the three southern rivers, from north to south, you can memorize them as RBS, Ravi Bias and Satlaj, were given to India. India could, India can only use 20% of the Indus basin, means water in the Indus river system. Whereas 80% of water is used by Pakistan, the very good friend of India. Come to the east. You can see near Tibet, there is written Sangpo R. The Sangpo is the name of Brahmaputra. You can see in the northeastern state, there is a big river called as Brahmaputra. And it is flowing into the Bangladesh and to the Bay of Bengal. In the northern plains, you can see the, see the Ganga river system. There are many tributaries of Ganga like Yamuna, Kain, Betwa, Son, Gagra, Kosi, Gandak, etc. Come to the plateau. You can see in the north of the peninsula there are two rivers. Those are parallel, Narmada and Tapi. Those are western flowing rivers. They flow through the rift valleys. And further south there are Godavari, Kaveri, Krishna, Tungabada. Those are the flowing in the eastern direction and they make they end up at the Bay of Bengal. So let's start the Himalayan rivers. The Indus, Ganga and Brahmaputra are the major Himalayan rivers. A river along with its tributaries may be called as a river system. So first the Indus river system. This Indus is also known as Sindhu. Let us see the source of Indus river system. The river Indus rises in Tibet which is a part of China. It is near Lake Mansarovar 
we all know Kailash Mansarovar, very holy place for Hindus. It enters India in the Ladakh district of Jammu and Kashmir, and it flows west towards Pakistan. The tributaries of Indus, Jaskar, Nubra, Shok, and Hunza, are the tributaries of Indus in the Kashmir region. Whereas Satluj, Bias, Ravi, Chinab, and the Jhelum join together to enter the Indus near Mithan Koti, Pakistan. The Indus plain has a very gentle slope, hence the flow of water will be very slow. The total length of Indus river system is 2,900 kilometers. One third of the Indus basin means 33 percent is located in India, in the states of Jammu and Kashmir, Himachal Pradesh, and the Punjab, whereas the rest of the basin is located in Pakistan. The second Himalayan river system is the Ganga river system. We call it as a Ganga Maya. There are many songs on Ganga Maya like Ram Tiri Ganga Meri or the famous song of Amitabh Bachchan is that uh, Khai Ke Paan Bana Raswala, Chora Ganga Ke Narewala like that. The headwaters of Ganga called as Bhagirathi is fed by the Gangotri Glacier. Means the originating point of Ganga River is assumed to be the Gangotri Glacier. Very easy. For Yamuna it is Yamunutri Glacier. The tributaries of Ganga Alaknanda joined at Dev Prayag in Uttarakhand. In the Uttarakhand state, the Bhagavati is joined by Alaknanda. And together the flow is called as Ganga at Dev Prayag. So, Alaknanda, which rises in the Badrinath. There is a movie, in a yes, South Indian movie, of Allu Arjun and Tamanna Bhatia. And its name is uh, Sangarshar Vijay. Yes, Sangarshar Vijay. In that, the Allu Arjun has the name of Badrinath, whereas the actress of that movie, Tamanna Bhatia, has the name of Alaknanda. So, you can see that movie in the geographic perspective, rather than just looking at the Romans. The Yamuna rises in the Yamunotri glacier, in the Himalayas, and joins at Alaba. Sorry, not Alaba, it's Prayagraj now. This government is changing the names, but no Baju ka better abhi vese ke vese. The Ghagra, the Gandak and the Kosi rise in the Nepal Himalayas. We saw the division of Himalayas. This Nepal Himalaya is the west to east division of Himalaya. The Chammal, Betwa and the Son rises from semi-arid areas. Means the areas of Madhya Pradesh and Rajasthan. The river bifurcates at Farakka in the west Bengal. Means it bifurcates into the distributaries at Farakka. The Bhagirati Hooghly, a distributary of the two flows southwards towards the delta plains of Bay of Bengal, to the Bay of Bengal. The main stream flows southward into the Bangladesh and is joined by the Brahmaputra. So, two mighty rivers are joined in the Bangladesh, making the, and at the end, they make the world's largest delta, known as Sundarman Delta. The total length of Ganga river system is 2500 kilometers, means less than in this river system. Sundarban Delta. The delta formed by the rivers, the Ganga and the Brahmaputra, is known as Sundarban Delta. We can see our national animal, that is Royal Bengal Tiger, over there. And also, the state animal of West Bengal state in India is the hunting cat. Okay. The last Himalayan river system is Brahmaputra river system. Look at the source of Brahmaputra river system. The Brahmaputra rises in Tibet east of Mansarovar Lake, whereas the Indus was originating at the west of Mansarovar Lake. And it is very close to the sources of Indus and settlers. The tributaries of Brahmaputra, Dibang, the Lohit and many other rivers are the tributaries of Brahmaputra. It flows eastward parallel to the Himalayas and it takes a U-turn. On reaching the Namcha Barwa, which is a peak in eastern Himalayas or Purvanchal, which is a height of 7,757 meters and enters India in Arunachal Pradesh through a god. Here it is called the Dihan and it is joined by the Dibang. So Dihan and Dibang they join and the Lohit and many with many other tributaries. In Tibet, the river carries a smaller volume of water because the Tibet is like cold desert and less silt as it is cold and dry area. In India, it is 
it passes through a region of high rainfall, mainly the northeastern India. And the river carries a long volume of water and considerable amount of silt. It forms many rivering islands, means the island inside a river. Every year during the rainy season, the river overflows the banks, causing widespread devastation due to floods in Assam and the Bangladesh. This river is also known as the Sorrow of Assam. The Majuli. Majuli is the world's largest river in island formed by the Brahmaputra that we have discussed in the So part two. The remaining topics I am going to cover in this video are the peninsula rivers, the lakes, roll up rivers in the economy and river pollution. So before starting peninsula rivers, just look at the map of peninsula India. You can find the two major western flowing rivers at the north of peninsula India or the Deccan Plateau. Those are Narmada and Tapi. Those two rivers are flowing through the rift valleys and they drain into the Arabian Sea. Whereas there are many major rivers which are eastern flowing like Godavari, Kaveri, Krishna, Mahanadi and Tungabhadra. They drain into the Bay of Bengal. So let's start the peninsula rivers. The main water divide in the peninsula India is formed by the western guards. These western guards lie parallel to the coastal plains of peninsular India. That means the western coastal plains. Major rivers of the peninsula such as Mahanadi, the Godavari, the Krishna and the Kaveri flow eastwards and they drain into the Bay of Bengal. The Narmada and the Tapi are the only long rivers which flow west and they make the Ichuris. These Ichuris are very nice fishing grounds. So the first basin of peninsula river, the river is the Narmada. So let's see the Narmada basin. The source, it rises in the Amar Kandak hills in Madhya Pradesh. It flows towards the west in a rift valley formed due to faulting. All the tributaries of Narmada are very short and most of these join the mainstream at right angles because Narmada flows through a rift valley which is located between the Sarpura ranges to the south and the Vindhyan ranges to the north. So most of its tributaries are meeting it at the right angles. The Narmada basin covers the part of Mahar Madhya Pradesh and Gujarat. Yes, these two states, Madhya Pradesh and Gujarat. On the Narmada, there is a big dam known as Sardar Sarovar in the Gujarat. And India constructed the tallest statue in the world at Sardar Sarovar. The tallest statue is located on the Sadhu Bet or the little island called as Sadhu Bet. It has a height of 182 meters which coincides with the constituencies in the Gujarat Legislative Assembly. This sculpture was made by the sculptor known his name is Ram Manji Sutar. He belongs to the way of Maharashtra. Second basin is the Tapi Basin. The source of Tapi it is in the Satpura Ranges which is in Baitul district of Madhya Pradesh. It also flows in a rift valley like Narmada parallel to the Narmada but it is a it is much shorter in length. Its basin covers parts of Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat and Maharashtra. Means three states. Other west flowing rivers are Sabarmati, Mahi, Bharatpudza and Periyar. Friends, the Sabarmati and Mahi are in the Gujarat state. Whereas the Bharatpudza and Periyar are in the Kerala state. Next river is the Mahanadi Basin. Source, the Mahanadi rises in the highlands of Chhattisgarh. It flows through Odisha to reach the Bay of Bengal. Means it is a eastern flowing river. It, its drainage basin is shared by Maharashtra, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand and Odisha. Four states. The total length of Mahanadi Basin is 860 kilometers. The Godavari Basin. Source. It rises from the slopes of western Ghats in the Nasik district of Maharashtra. Particularly Tambakeshwar. It is the largest peninsular river. The tributaries of Godavari. 
कुर्णा वर्धा प्राणहिता मांजरा वैनगंगा एंड पैनगंगा आर द ट्रिब्युटरीज द बेसिन कवर्स पार्ट ऑफ महाराष्ट्र मध्य प्रदेश ओडिशा एंड आंध्र प्रदेश इट ड्रेन्स इन टू द बे ऑफ बेंगाल मीन्स इट इज ऑल्सो द ईस्टर्न फ्लोइंग रिवर द टोटल लेंथ ऑफ गोदावरी बेसिन इज फिफ्टीन हंड्रेड किलोमीटर बिकॉज ऑफ इट्स लार्ज लेंथ एंड द लार्ज एरिया इट कवर्स इट इज ऑल्सो नोन एज दक्षिण गंगा फ्रेंड्स ऑलवेज रिमेंबर द गोदावरी इज नोन एज दक्षिण गंगा वेर एज कावेरी इज नोन एज दक्षिण भारत की गंगा नेक्स्ट इज द कृष्णा बेसिन इट राइजेस फ्रॉम स्प्रिंग नियर महाबलेश्वर इट इज अ फेवरेट टूरिस्ट स्पॉट एंड हिल स्टेशन इन महाराष्ट्र ट्रिब्यूटरीज ऑफ कृष्णा आर तुंगभद्रा कोयना गटप्रभा मुसी एंड भीमा द टोटल लेंथ इज फोर्टीन हंड्रेड किलोमीटर इट्स ड्रेनेज बेसिन इज सेड बाय महाराष्ट्र कर्नाटक एंड आंध्र प्रदेश नेक्स्ट बेसिन इज द कावेरी बेसिन सोर्स इट राइजेस इन द ब्रह्मगिरी रेंज ऑफ द वेस्टर्न गार्ड्स द ट्रिब्यूटरीज ऑफ कावेरी आर अमरावती भवानी हेमावती एंड काबिनी द टोटल लेंथ इज सेवन सिक्सटी किलोमीटर द कावेरी रीच इज द बे ऑफ बेंगाल इन साउथ ऑफ कडलोर इन तमिलनाडु मीन्स इट इज अस्टर्न फ्लोइंग रिवर अदर ईस्ट फ्लोइंग रिवर्स आर दामोदर ब्राह्मणी बैतरणी एंड सुवर्ण रेखा सो द नेक्स्ट टॉपिक इज लेक्स India has many lakes which differ from each other in the size and the other characteristics. Most lakes are permanent while some contain water only during the rainy season. Some of the lakes are the result of the action of glaciers. You can see them in the Himalayas, mountain ranges and ice sheets. While others have been formed by wind, river action and human activities means they are artificial. Those are created by human activities. Meandering river Across a flood plain forms cutoffs that later develop into the Oxbow Lakes. Friends, these all Oxbow Lakes are nothing but the landforms or the lakes created by the deposition of work of rivers on the plains, and they have shape like English letter or English alphabet U. Most of the freshwater lakes are in the Himalayan region because. There are many glaciers. They form when glaciers dug out a basin which was later filled with the snow melt when the temperature increases or in the summer. The Ular Lake in Jammu and Kashmir is the result of tectonic activity and it is the largest freshwater lake in the India. Friends, remember the largest freshwater lake in India is Ular Lake, which is in Jammu and Kashmir, whereas the largest brackish water or salt water salt water lake in India is the Chilika Lake. Which is in Odisha. Artificial lakes. The damming of the rivers for the generation of hydropower has also led to the formation of lakes such as Guru Gobind Sagar, which is nothing but the Bhakra Nangal project. It is on the river Satluj. So importance of lakes. Lakes help to regulate the flow of river, means they are like wall. During heavy rainfall, it prevents flooding. And during the dry season, it helps to maintain an even flow of water. Also used for developing the hydropower, which makes our electricity need. They moderate the climate of the surrounding, no doubt. The main, the maintaining of aquatic ecosystem is done by lakes. Lakes enhance the natural beauty. Lakes helps in developing the tourism and providing the recreation for people. Role of rivers in the economy. From ancient times, river banks attracted settlers, as water from the rivers is a basic natural resource which is essential for the various human activities. Friends, someone has said that water is life. Four thousand years ago, our Indian subcontinent, as the oldest civilization in the world, in the form of Harappa and Mohenjo-daro, and those were in the Indus Valley, means the water. is very essential for human life rivers are used for irrigation navigation and hydropower generation for the electricity so next topic is river pollution the demand for what water from the river is increasing to meet the growing domestic municipal industrial and agricultural need which naturally affects the quality of water more and more water is being drained out of the rivers reducing their volumes as the need is increasing hence human is being drained out the rivers and hence the volume of the rivers is 
getting reduced. Also, a heavy load of untreated sewage and industrial effluents are emptied into the rivers, which affects not only the quality of water but also the self cleansing capacity of the river. Due to those chemicals, the pH of water in the river is getting changed. Hence, it is also impacting badly on the river ecosystem. Concern about it is concern about the rising pollution in our rivers led to the launching of various action plans to clean the rivers. For example, Gangali River Plan that, that was started in 1985. So let us see, do we know from this chapter? First, the world's largest drainage basin is of Amazon River. Friends, this Amazon River is in South America continent. It rises from the Andes Mountains and flows towards east and drains into the Atlantic Ocean in Brazil. Always remember, the largest river of world is Amazon, whereas the longest river of world is Nile, which is in Africa. Second, according to the regulation of Indus Water Treaty, which was signed in the 1960 between India and Pakistan and brokered by World Bank, India can use only 20% of the total water carried by the Indus River system. Friends, this Indus River system has six rivers. The three of the north means Chinab, Jhelum and Indus were given to Pakistan where three of the south means Ravi, Bias and Satlaj were given to India. But India could only use the 20% water. This water is used for irrigation in the Punjab, Haryana and the southern and western parts of Rajasthan. Third point, the Sundarban Delta derives its name from the Sundri tree which grows well in the marshy land. It is the world's largest and fastest growing delta. It is also the home of Royal Bengal Tiger, which is our national animal. Fourth point, Brahmaputra is known as Sanko in Tibet and Jamuna in Bangladesh. Fifth point, 71% of the world's surface is covered with water, but 97% of that water is salt water, means we have only the 3% of fresh water. Out of the, that 3%, that is fresh water. Three quarters of it means 75% of that is trapped as ice. Means we have very less water. And in a country like India, we should be servants. We should be working on the reservation and restoration of water in the dams for agriculture, for domestic use. There should be the percentages of water uses in terms of domestic, in terms of agriculture and for a fourth chapter of land geography and CRT that is climate. Let's see the topics in this chapter. Introduction of climate and weather. Climatic controls. Factors affecting India's climate. The Indian monsoon. The onset of monsoon and withdrawal. The seasons. Distribution of rainfall. And monsoon as a unifying one. Friends, in the part first, I will cover the first four topics. So, introduction. Climate refers to the sum total of weather conditions and variations over a large area for a long period of time. The time usually is more than 30 years. So, climate is a long time idea. Whereas weather refers to the state of the atmosphere over an area at any point of time. It could be two hours, it could be one day, it could be a week. So, climate is a long time idea why the weather is short time idea. The world is divided into a number of climatic regions. The climate of India is mainly described as the climate of monsoon type. So the elements of climate and weather. The elements of both climate and weather are same. Those are five. Temperature, atmospheric pressure, wind, humidity and precipitation. Friends, the temperature is nothing but degree of hotness or coldness of the body. Atmospheric pressure is nothing but the pressure that is exerted by the atmosphere on us and it is usually taken as 1 atmosphere or 1.01325 bars. Third factor is, third element is wind. The flowing air is nothing but wind. Humidity. The amount of water vapors present in the air is termed as humidity. And the last is precipitation. It could be anything 
that is falling from the clouds in the sky. It includes snowfall, the rainfall, and the devastating hills. So let's see some basics because geography is a semi scientific subject, and in the chapter of climate, there are some terms. So before going to see that, we should have some basics. First is latitudes. Latitudes are nothing but the horizontal imaginary lines on the earth globe. They explain the position of the particular area as north to south from equator. Friends, the equator is 0 degree latitude. It, it is in the center of earth globe. Longitudes. The longitudes are nothing but the vertical imaginary lines. They indicate the position of that particular area as east to west from Greenwich Meridian. The Greenwich Meridian is nothing but GMT. It is considered as 0 degree latitude. Third is altitude. The altitude is nothing but the height from the sea level. Direction of wind. It is always from high pressure to low pressure. Always remember, the direction of wind will be always from high pressure to low pressure. In summer, the mainland India has low pressure and high temperature. And in winter, the mainland India has high pressure and low temperature. So just remember, the pressure and temperature will be contradictory. Means when the mainland India will have low pressure, the temperature of it will be higher and vice versa. So let's see the climatic controls. There are six major climatic controls that define the climate of any place. The first is latitude. The temperature decreases from equator to poles as one moves from equator to poles. This is due to the slanting of the solar radiation or the solar waves. Second is altitude. Altitude is nothing but the height. And as we one move upwards to higher altitudes, the temperature gets decreased. In general, for 160 meters of height, the temperature decreased by 1 degree Celsius. Third is pressure and wind system. The pressure and wind system also impacts the rainfall and temperature. In the news, you, you, always come, you may always come across the news like there is a low pressure area created in the Bay of Bengal and as it gets intensified, the rainfall will increase. So, this is that phenomenon. Fourth, the distance from the sea. It is also termed as continentality. The seas have moderate, moderating influence on the near area. For example, the places on the coastal regions like Mumbai and Chennai will not, ex will not experience the changes in the day and night temperature very much. But the places in the mainland India which are away from the sea like Delhi or Jaipur they will experience the very sharp changes in the day and night temperatures or the changes in the temperature of summer and winter. Fifth, the ocean currents. There are two types of ocean currents that are cold and hot currents. They also impact the climate of that region. Final is the relief features. Relief features are kind of barrier like mountains and hills and they also impact the climate of that region. The factors affecting India's climate. First factor is latitude. The Tropic of Cancer, that is 23.5 degree north latitude, which passes through the middle of country from Gujarat in the west to the Mizoram in the east. Friends, this Tropic of Cancer passes through eight states of India. Those are from west to east, Gujarat, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, West Bengal, Tripura and Mizoram. The areas lying south to it is known as tropical, whereas the area lying north to it is subtropical. Therefore, India's climate has characteristics of both tropical as well as subtropical and this idea is very, you can clear this idea from the adjacent image. Altitude. India has mountains to the north. We know that the Himalayan mountains are present over the northern states and the north boundary of India, including India, Nepal and Bhutan as well. Those mountains to the north has an average height of about 6000 meters or 6 kilometers. India also has a coastal region having average height just 30 meters. So you can see in the adjacent figure that in the north you will get the colors like white and red whereas in the coastal area you will get the colors like green. So the coastal area has very 
less height, average height that is of 30 meters. The Himalayas prevent the cold winds coming from Central Asia from entering the Indian subcontinent. They are protecting us. The Himalayas are nothing but the barrier which is created by Mother Nature to take care of mainland India. It is because of these mountains that this subcontinent experiences comparatively milder winters than the Central Asia. Third factor is pressure and winds. In between, in the pressure and winds, there are three components. Pressure and surface wind, upper air circulation and western cyclonic disturbances and tropical cyclones. So first, the pressure and surface winds. The pressure and end wind conditions over India are very unique. During winters, there is high pressure area north of the Himalayas. So the area having high pressure area will have the low temperatures. Cold dry winds blow from this region to the low pressure areas over the oceans to the south. Yes, in general, the wind will flow from high pressure to low pressure area. Whereas in summer, the condition will be reverse. There is a low pressure area develops over interior Asia as well as in the northwestern India. Hence, the air moves in reverse direction that is from south to north means from oceans to mainland India. These winds blow over the ocean. Hence, they take the moisture with them and bring the widespread rainfall over the mainland India and which is termed as monsoon. Second, the upper air circulation. The higher level of atmosphere is dominated by a westerly flow. Hence, the winds will coming from western direction. An important component of this flow is the jet stream. Hence, this jet stream represent over the altitude of 12 kilometers or 12,000 meters from the earth surface. The jet stream are a narrow belt of high altitude westerly winds in the troposphere. These jet streams are located approximately over the 27 to 30 degrees north latitude, means they are present over the north of tropical cancer. The third factor is western cyclonic disturbances and tropical cyclones. The western disturbances which enter the Indian subcontinent from the west and the northwest during the winter months originate over the Mediterranean Sea and are brought to India by westerly jet stream. Friends, this Mediterranean Sea is on the is near the boundary of Africa continent and Europe continent and which is west which is in western direction to India. The tropical cyclones originate over the Bay of Bengal and the Indian Ocean. The tropical cyclones occur during the monsoons as well as in October and November. And they are part of the easterly flows, means they are coming from east, whereas the western cyclonic disturbances coming from west, from the Mediterranean Sea. The Indian monsoon, this is my favorite topic. Just because of this phenomena, the life on the Indian subcontinent is fostered from the past. Monsoon are seasonal winds which reverse their, their direction of flow with the change of season. The climate of India is strongly influenced by the monsoon winds. So, we will see the factors that affect the mechanism of Indian monsoon. First, the differential heating and cooling of land and water. Hence, the specific heat carrying capacity of land and water is different. Therefore, it will create a low pressure on land while the sea experiences higher pressure. Because the land will take time to cool down, but the water in the oceans will cool down very fastly. Hence, the land will have high temperature but low pressure and the oceans will have low temperature but high pressure. The shifting of intertropical conversion zones that is ITCZ that is shifted over the Ganga plain during the summers and the conversion zones it is, it is nothing but the zone where the two kinds of winds will converge or come towards each other. The intensity and position of high pressure areas towards the east of Madagascar approximately as 20 degrees south over the Indian Ocean affects the Indian monsoon. So let us see where the Madagascar is. So this is the world map. We have talked about the Mediterranean Sea. It has the it is between the Europe and Africa. And from that Mediterranean Sea, the western disturbances will come to towards India. So this is Madagascar in the Indian Ocean. The uh, island to the east of Africa in yellow color you can see. So the position of Madagascar is east of Africa and the climate that is the phenomenon of monsoon is also affected by the
is also affected. Due to a high pressure area created over the east of Madagascar. The heating up of Tibetan plateau in summers create low pressure area above the plateau. You can see the Tibet which is in China, north of India. And the heating in the Tibet creates low pressure area. So the winds will come from ocean that is high pressure area to low pressure area of Tibet and give widespread rainfall in the Indian subcontinent. The movement of the westerly jet stream to the north of Himalaya and the presence of tropical easterly jet stream over the Indian Peninsula during summer also affect the Indian monsoon. So there is a one topic called a southern oscillation and it impacts monsoon in a very large way at a certain year between 2 to 5 years. So before going to southern oscillation, let's just see some geogra geographical places. So, comes toward the South America, which is like a, a pink in shape. To the west of it, there is a coast called as Peruvian coast. It will be important while understanding the southern oscillation. Also, look, this is the Australia. Australia has Indian Ocean to the west, while on the east, it has Pacific Ocean. So, let's start the southern oscillation. The pressure conditions over the southern oceans also affect the monsoons. Normally, when the tropical eastern South Pacific Ocean experiences high pressure, means that region will have low temperature. The tropical eastern Indian Ocean experiences low pressure, means that will have high temperature. But in certain years, there is a reversal in pressure conditions. This periodic change in the pressure condition is known as, uh, known as southern oscillation. And due to these conditions, on certain year, India suffers from drought. And the reason for India to suffer from, suffer from drought is termed as El Nino. So let us see what is El Nino. It is a phenomenon in which a warm ocean current that flows past the Peruvian coast in place of cold Peruvian current. So look at this Peruvian coast. In the normal year, the Peruvian coast may have colder ocean currents. But when the El Nino is in operation, the coast will experience a warm ocean current. And that will happen in every 2 to 5 years. This phenomenon hence also known as ENSO that is El Nino Southern Oscillation. So let's see the El Nino from this figure. Look at the map of South America. To the west, it has Peruvian coast. And during the normal year, it will have the cold ocean currents current along the Peruvian coast. So it is given in the blue wind shape. Whereas the region of Australia will have warm ocean current. But in the El Nino year, the Peruvian coast have the warm current instead of cold current. That's why it is given in warm in the second diagram. And so it will impact the Indian monsoon and India will receive less precipitation than the average year of fourth chapter of ninth anxiety geography that is climate. So let's start the video. The remaining topics to be discussed are the onset of monsoon and its withdrawal, the seasons in India, the distribution of rainfall and the last monsoon as a uniform bond. So let's start our first topic of this lecture. The onset of monsoon and its withdrawal. The duration of monsoon is 100 to 120 days from early June to mid September. When the monsoon arrives, the normal rainfall increases suddenly and continues constantly for several days. This phenomenon is known as burst of the monsoon. The monsoon arrives at southern tip of Indian Peninsula that is Kerala generally by the first week of June or first of June. It proceeds into two branches, the Arabian Sea branch and the Bay of Bengal branch. The withdrawal of monsoon is a gradual process. It begins in the northwestern states of India by early September that means in Gujarat and Rajasthan. By mid-October, it withdraws completely from the northern half of the peninsula and by December, the monsoons retreat completely from the rest of India. So, let's discuss the seasons. There are four main seasons that can be identified in India. Those are the cold weather season means winter, second the hot weather season means summer, third is the advancing monsoon and the final is the retreating monsoon. Let's see them one by one. The cold weather season or winter. 
The cold weather season begins from mid November in northern India and stay till February. December and January are the coldest months in northern part of India. The temperature decreases from south to the north. Friends, we know that the Tropic of Cancer, that is 23.5 degrees north latitude, divides India into almost two equal halves. So, the part to the south of the Tropic of Cancer is tropical, whereas on the north it is subtropical. And as we move from equator to poles, the temperature gets reduced. And as we move from South India to North India in the winter season, the temperature gets reduced. The average temperature of Chennai, which is in South, on the eastern coast is between 24 to 25 degrees Celsius. While in the northern plains, means in UP, Bihar or Delhi, the temperature is only 10 to 15 degrees Celsius. The days are warm and the nights are cold. The frost is common in the north and the higher slopes of Himalaya explain snowfall. As they are at higher altitude, the temperatures decrease reduced further beyond the freezing point, that is 0 degrees Celsius. Hence, the Himalayas experience snowfall. During this season, north northeast trade winds prevail over the country. They blow from land to the sea, and hence most of the part in the country is dry in this area. But some amount of rainfall occurs on the Tamil Nadu coast, means near Chennai, because of the blowing of these northeast trade winds from Bay of Bengal. You can see in the adjacent figure, the northeast trade winds are blowing, but when they come to the coast of Tamil Nadu, they come with, it, come with the moisture that is, that is gathered from the Bay of Bengal and they give rainfall to the Tamil Nadu coast in winter. The weather is normally marked by clear sky, low temperature and low humidity and feeble variable winds means weather is very pleasant and most of the long trips are arranged in India by the tourists in this season. Characteristic feature of cold weather season over the northern plains is the inflow of cyclonic disturbances from the west means those are known as westerly cyclonic disturbances. This low pressure system originates over the Mediterranean Sea. We saw in the last lecture the sea is located between Africa and Europe continent and the western Asia and move into the India from west along with the westerly flow. They cause the much needed winter rains over the plains and snowfall in the higher mountains of Himalaya. Although the total amount of winter rainfall is locally known as Mahavad is small but they are of immense importance for the cultivation of Rabi crops. Friends, there are three kinds of crops that are cultivated in India. Kharif, Rabi and Zaid. The Kharif crops are cultivated in the rainy season and the best example of Kharif crop is Bajra. The Rabi crops are cultivated in the winter season. The best example for it is wheat. And the Zaid crops are cultivated in the months of mainly April and May. The example for them is cucumber and watermelon. The peninsula region does not have a well-defined cold season. There is hardly any noticeable seasonal changes in the temperature pattern during the winters due to the moderating influence of the sea because on its three sides there are seas like Arabian Sea, Bay of Bengal and the Indian Oceans. The second season is the hot weather season or summer. The hot weather season in India ranges from March to May. The temperatures are more than 45 degrees in the North India. In peninsular India, the temperatures remains lower due to the moderating influence of the oceans. In the last lecture, we have discussed this. That's why, that is the reason why the summer of Pune or the Bangalore is durable than the summer as compared to the summer of Jaipur and Delhi. The summer months experience rising temperature and the falling air pressure. Yes, they are both contradictory to each other. The high temperature will have low pressure area in the northern part of the country. Towards the end of May, an elongated low pressure area develops in the region extending from the Thar Desert in the northwest to the Patna and Chota Nagpur Plateau in the east and southeast. The circulation of air begins to set in around this trough. This trough is nothing but low pressure area and it will attract the wind from high pressure area. That will be the circulation of air. The striking feature of the summer season, Lu. These are strong, gusty, hot, dry winds blowing during the day over the north and northwestern India. Sometimes they even continue until the late evening. Direct exposure to these winds may even prove to be fertile. Dust storms are very common during the month of May in the northern India. 
these swamps bring temporary relief as they lower the temperature due to their gusty winds and may bring light rain and cool breeze. This is also the season for localized thunderstorms. You can see the adjacent diagram. The localized thunderstorms are known by different names where different areas of India. The violent winds, torrential downpours, often accompanied by hails. In West Bengal, these storms are also known as Kal Baisaki. Towards the close of summer season, pre-monsoon showers are common, especially in Kerala and Karnataka. They help in the early ripening of mangoes and hence they are known as mango showers. In Maharashtra and Goa, there is a coconut coast and these rain showers also come there and in the local language they are known as Ambra Sari, meaning mango showers. In the area near Assam, it is known as Bardoli Chiraha. In West Bengal, it is known as Kalbesaki, where the northern part of India it is identified by Lu. Third season is the advancing monsoon or the rainy season, very favorite season of everyone. By the early June, the low pressure condition over the northern plains intensifies. It attracts the trade winds from southern hemisphere. Means southern hemisphere, the oceans over there have high pressure, whereas the Indian mainland has the low pressure. Hence, it attracts the trade winds. This southeast trade winds originate over the warm subtropical areas of southern oceans. They cross the equator and blow in the southwest direction, entering the Indian Peninsula as the southwest monsoon. As these winds blow over the warm oceans, they bring abundant moisture to the Indian subcontinent. The inflow of southwest monsoon into India brings about a total change in the weather. Means the summer is now replaced by rainy season. Early in the season, the windward side of western Ghats receive very heavy rainfall, more than 250 centimeters. This happens due to the orographic rain. As the orographic rain happens there, the clouds lose their moisture and when they come to the leeward side of the western Ghats, they give less rainfall. The maximum rainfall of this season is received in the northeastern part of the country. Mosindra near Cherapunji in the southern ranges of Khasi Hills receives the highest average rainfall not only in India but also in the world which is located in Meghalaya. Rainfall in the Ganga Valley decreases from east to west. The less the Rajasthan and parts of Gujarat get scanty rainfall means less than 300 mm. So what are the characteristics of this monsoon? Breaks in the rainfall. Monsoon has dry and wet space. Rain takes place only for some days at a time. Yes, we know that. If there are, the season of rainfall is of 4 months, it's not like that it will rain for 120 days continuously. The, the special distribution of rainfall related to the monsoon true. Friends, this monsoon true is nothing but the low pressure areas. And if this low pressure area is on certain part of India, then that part of India will have good rainfall. The monsoon is also known for its uncertainties. We all know that. While it causes heavy floods in one part, it may be responsible for droughts in the other. Yes, the best example is this year's monsoon. There is heavy flood in the western Maharashtra, whereas the Marathwada part of Maharashtra is in drought. It is often irregular, irregular in its arrival and retreat. Yes. The monsoon is just like us. We are also irregular during our college days. But we are only late. The monsoon can be early or late. Friends, the country where all people in hurry but very few are on time. The country is India. So we can't allege monsoon. Hence, it sometimes disturbs the farming schedule of millions of farmers all over the country and it hampers the backbone of Indian economy that is agriculture. So these are the two maps which are very important in understanding the advancing of monsoon and the retreating of monsoon. You can see on the left, left side map on 1st June the monsoon arrives at south tip of mainland India that is Kerala. On the 10th June it occupies 50% of the peninsular India and arrives at the Mumbai. After 15 July, 
it occupies total India. So just see the the retreating and or the post monsoon. During October and November, the movement of the sun towards south causes the monsoon trough in the northern plains to become weaker. This happens due to the apparent movement of the sun. I will bring a fresh video for that apparent movement of the sun phenomenon. The retreat of monsoon is marked by clear skies and rising temperature. While day temperatures are high, nights are cool and pleasant. The land is still moist due to the rain. Owing to the conditions of high temperature and high humidity, the weather becomes rather oppressive during the day. This term is commonly known as October heat. In the second half of October, the mercury begins to fall rapidly in the northern India, hence the temperature gets decreased, which indicates the arrival of winter season. By the early November, the low pressure conditions over the northwestern India get transferred to the Bay of Bengal. This causes the cyclonic depression or storms. These cyclones generally cross the eastern coast of India and cause heavy and widespread rain over the eastern coast, including Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, and Odisha. These tropical cyclones are often very destructive. So let's see the right side map, map on the right side of this figure. It, ex it uh, explains the retreating monsoons. On 1st September, the retreating monsoon starts its journey from northwestern state of India, that is Rajasthan. Till the 1 October and till December, it retreats from all the India. The next topic is distribution of rainfall. The parts of western coast and northwestern India receive over about 400 centimeters of rainfall annually. However, it is less than 60 cm in western Rajasthan and adjoining parts of Gujarat, Haryana and Punjab. Rainfall is equally low in the interior of Deccan Plateau and east of Sayadri. Because of the windward side of Sayadri's experience orographic rain, whereas the Deccan Plateau, the interior of Deccan Plateau lies in the rain shadow area. A third area of low precipitation is around Leh in Jammu and Kashmir and it is treated as the cold desert. The rest of the country receives moderate rainfall. The snowfall is restricted to the Himalayan region only. Means in the states of Jammu Kashmir, parts of Uttarakhand, parts of Himachal Pradesh, parts of Sikkim, and parts of Arunachal Pradesh. So this is the distribution of rain. You can see the very less rainfall means faint color over the northwestern India and in the north part of Jammu and Kashmir that is layer and in the interior of Deccan Plateaus. Whereas you can see the dark color in the western coastal area as well as in the northeastern state. The most rainfall is in the Meghalaya that is in the darkest color in the northeastern part and that is over 11,000 mm annually. So let's see the next topic monsoon as a uniform boy. The way Himalayas protect the subcontinent from extremely cold winds from the central Asia from the Central Asia. This enables Northern India to have uniformly higher temperatures when compared to the other areas of on the same latitudes. Similarly, the peninsula plateau under the influence of sea from three sides has moderate temperatures. Despite such moderating influences, there are great variations in the temperature conditions. Nevertheless, the uniform influence of the monsoon on the Indian subcontinent is quite perceptible. The seasonal alteration of wind systems and the associated weather conditions provide a rhythmic cycle of seasons and those seasons are winter, summer, advancing monsoon and retreating monsoon. Even the uncertainties of rain and uneven distribution are very much typical of monsoons. The Indian landscapes, its plants and animals that is flora and fauna, its entire agricultural calendar, the life of the people including their festivals revolve around this phenomenon. Year after year, people of India from north to south and from east to west eagerly await the arrival of monsoon. These monsoon winds bind the whole country by providing water to set the agriculture activities in motion. The river valleys which carry this water also unite as a single river valley unit. And India is known for unity in diversity. Hence, this natural phenomenon that is monsoon also unifies India in unique way. Let's see, do you know from this chapter? 
First, the word monsoon is derived from the Arabic word called as mosin, which literally means season. In certain places, there is a wide difference between day and night temperatures. For example, in the Thar Desert, the day temperature may rise up to the 50 degrees Celsius and drop down to near 15 degrees Celsius the same night. On the other hand, there is hardly any difference in day and night temperatures in the Andaman Nicobar Islands or in Kerala due to the moderating influence of sea. Monsoon Ram, the wettest place on the earth, is also reputed for its stalagmite and stalactite. In the image, you can see the stalactite and stalagmite. Those are the depositional landform of the ground water. That is natural vegetation and wildlife. The topics in this chapter are introduction, factors for biodiversity, the types of vegetation, wildlife in India, conservation of flora and fauna, and the last, governmental steps. So let's start the lecture. First, the introduction. India is one of the 12 mega biodiversity countries of the world. The plant species in India are 47,000, which And in plant diversity, India is 10th in the world and 4th in Asia. There are about 15,000 flowering plants in India, which account for 6% of the total number of flowering plants in the world. When we talk about animal species, they are 90,000. And India also has a rich variety of fish in fresh as well as its marine waters. Virgin vegetation. A plant community which has grown naturally without human aid and has been left undisturbed by humans for a long, long time is called as virgin vegetation. The flora is used to denote plants whereas the fauna is the term which is used to denote the animals. So the factors for biodiversity. There are three factors. They are relief, climate and ecosystem. Let us see them one by one. First the relief. In relief the sub factor is land. The nature of land influences the type of vegetation. The fertile lands support agriculture while undulating and the rough terrains like mountains have grassland and woodlands which give shelter to a variety of wildlife. Second is soil. The different types of soils provide basis for the different types of vegetation, of course. The sandy soils of the desert support cactus and thorny bushes just like aloe vera, while the wet marshy delta soils support the mangroves, for example, sundry tree and the delta vegetation. The hill slopes with some depth of soil have the conical trees. Second factor is climate. In that, the three sub factors are temperature, sunlight, and precipitation. First, the temperature. The character and extent of vegetation are mainly determined by temperature along with the humidity in the air, precipitation, and the type of soil. Second is sunlight. Due to the differences in latitude, altitude, season, and the duration of day, there is a variation in duration of sunlight. Yes, of course, there is a reaction which is known as photosynthesis. And the main factor that is required for the photosynthesis is nothing but the sunlight. And we know as we move from equator to poles, the duration of the day and the sunlight decreases. When we go up altitude, the atmosphere becomes dilated and the temperature reduces. Also, the seasons affect the nature of sunlight and hence the ecosystem. Also, factor is precipitation. The areas of heavy rainfall have more dense vegetation as compared to the areas of less rainfall. In India, almost the entire rainfall is brought in by the advancing southwest monsoon that is from June to September and the retreating northeast monsoon. The last factor is ecosystem. All the plants and animals in an area are interdependent and interrelated to each other in their physical environment, thus forming an ecosystem. The nature of plants in an area to a large extent determines the animal life in that area. Of course, most of the animals are dependent for food on the most of the animals are dependent upon the trees for their food need. Hence, the kind of animal life is dependent upon the nature of plants. Human beings are also an integral part of the ecosystem. A very large ecosystem on land having distinct types of vegetation and animal life is called a biome. Means biome is similar to ecosystem, but only difference is that size and the area. So let's come towards. So let us discuss the types of vegetation. There are five main types of vegetations that are identified in our country. First is tropical evergreen forest. Second, the tropical deciduous forest. Third, the tropical thorn forest and shrubs. 
fourth is mountain forest and the last is mangrove forest in the adjacent map you can see the dark shade of green color this color indicates the tropical evergreen forest those are along the western coast a small part of tamil nadu coast and most part of the northeastern state the faint green color which is on which is covering most of the area of indian mainland denotes the tropical deciduous forest the mountain forest is limited to mountainous region which is of course in the north of the india where himalayas are there mangrove forest are limited to coastal regions and the trop tropical thorn forest are in the major part of gujarat and rajasthan as well as the rain shadow area of deccan plateau so let us see them one by one first the tropical evergreen forests these forests are restricted to heavy rainfall areas of western ghats and the island groups of lakshadweep andaman and nicobar upper parts of assam and tamil nadu coast the trees reach great heights up to 60 meters or even above it has multi layer structure since this region is warm and wet throughout the year in the adjacent diagram you can see the trees are in multi layered fashion they are having a large canopy as well as there are small trees small plants herbs and creepers as also there commercially important trees of this forest are ebony mahogany rosewood rubber and cinchona the common animals found in this forest are elephants monkey lemur and tiger plenty of birds bats sloth scorpions and snails are also found in the tropical evergreen forest second is tropical deciduous forest it is the most widespread forest in the india these are also called as the monsoon forest and spread over the region receiving rainfall between 200 cm and 70 cm trees of this forest type shed their leaves for about 6 to 8 weeks in the dry summers hence they are called as deciduous forest These forests are further divided into the two types: moist deciduous and dry deciduous. First, the moist deciduous. This forest found in the areas which receive rainfall between 200 and 100 cm. Present, they are present mostly in the eastern part of the country, including northeastern states along the foothills of Himalaya, Jharkhand, West Odisha and Chhattisgarh, and on the eastern slopes of the western Ghats. Teak is the most dominant species of this forest. Commercially important species are bamboo, sag, sesam, sandalwood, hair, kusum, arjun and mulberry. Second, dry deciduous forest. These are found in areas having rainfall between 100 to 70 cm. They are present in the rainier parts of the peninsular plain and the plains of Bihar and UP. There are open stretches in which teak, sag, pipal, neem grow. A large part of this region has been cleared for cultivation and for grazing of the cattle. Common animals found here are lion, tiger, pig, deer, and elephant. Also, a huge variety of birds, lizards, snakes, and tortoises also found in dry deciduous forest. You can see in these images the tropical deciduous forest and the thorn and scrubs, which is the next topic of our discussion. So, the third vegetation type, that is thorn forest and scrubs, these are found in the region of which less than 70 cm of rain. That means arid zone. The natural vegetation consists of thorny trees and bushes. Acacias, palms, euphorbias, and cacti are the main plant species. Trees are scattered and have long roots, penetrating deep into the soil to get the moisture. Because this area is deficient in the water, the stems are succulent to conserve the water. Leaves are mostly thick and small to minimize the evaporation. That process is nothing but transpiration. Hence, the leaves are small. because they want they wanted to reduce the loss of water vapor through their stomata by the process of transpiration common animals are rats mice rabbits fox wolf tiger lion wild ass horses and camels the fourth type of vegetation is mountain forest that means forest of the mountain mountain forest have a succession of natural vegetation belts in the same order as we see from tropical to tundra region Between a height of 1,000 to 2,000 meters, the wet temperate type of forest containing evergreen broadleaf trees such as oaks, chestnuts are predominant. Between 1,500 to 3,000 meters, the temperate forest containing coniferous trees like pine, deodar, silver fir, spruce, and cedar are found. At high elevations, temperate grasslands are found. At high altitudes, generally more than 3,600 meters above the sea level, 
alpine vegetation found which of silver fir junipers pines and birches trees are found near the snow line means the part above snow line is always having snow throughout the year shrubs and scrubs they merge into the alpine grassland which are used extensively for grazing by nomadic tribes of india like gujjars and bakarwals at high altitudes mosses and lichens form part of tundra vegetation the common animals found in this forest are kashmir stag spotted deer wild sheep jack rabbit tibetan antelope yak snow leopard squirrels shaggy horn wild ibex deer and the rare red pant sheep and goats with teeth eight you can see the mountain forest in the first image and in the second image the forest is mangrove kind of forest these trees are sundri trees which is the next topic of our discussion so let's come towards the last type of vegetation that is mangrove forest this forest are found in the areas of coast that are influenced by tides where mud and silt gets accumulated dense mangroves are the common varieties with the roots of plants submerged under the water these are the deltas of ganga mahanadi the krishna the godavari and the kaveri means the large rivers of india in the ganga brahmaputra delta sundar trees are found hence that part is known as sundarbans which provide durable hard timber palm coconut kevra agar also grow in some parts of delta the royal bengal tiger is the famous animal lives here which is the national animal of our country also turtles crocodiles gharias and snakes are found in this forest let's talk about the wildlife in india india has about 2000 species of birds which constitute 13% of world's total there are 2546 species of fish which constitute for 12% of total world stock it also shares between 5 to 8% of world's amphibians reptiles and mammals hence india is one of the mega biodiversity countries in the world elephants are found in the hot waste forests of assam karnataka and kerala the one horn rhinoceros live in the swampy and marshy lands of assam and west bengal the run of curs is habitat of wild ass and camels are found in the thar desert of rajasthan india is only country in the world that has both tigers and lions that is unique the gir forest in gujarat is natural habitat of lion whereas tigers are found in the forest of madhya pradesh the sundarbans of west bengal and the himalayan region the himalayas harbor a hardy range of animals which survive in the extreme cold that is negative temperatures the ladakh freezing high altitudes are home to yak the shaggy horn wild ox weighing around 1 ton that is 1000 kg the tibetan antelope the bharal which is known as blue sheep wild sheep and the kiya that is tibetan wild ass in the rivers lakes and coastal areas turtles crocodiles and gharias are found birds like peacocks pigeons duck parakeets cranes pigeons are some of the birds that are inhabiting the forest and wetlands of the country in the addition map you can see the wildlife sanctuary bird sanctuary and national parks of india so the conservation of flora and fauna the excessive exploitation of the plants and animals resources by human beings disturb the ecosystem about 1300 plant species are endangered and the 20 species are extinct also few animals are endangered and some have been become extinct for example the asian cheetah has been extinct from india since the year of 1952 the causes for these traits are hunting by greedy hunters for commercial purposes pollution due to chemical and industrial waste and acid deposits the introduction of alien species reckless cutting of the forest to bring land under cultivation and inhabitation and this is happening due to the overburden of population in india because india has only india has only 2.5% of world's total land but has more than 17% of world total population the governmental steps the 14 biosphere reserves have been set up in the country to protect the flora and fauna means vegetation and wildlife the financial and technical assistance is provided to many botanical gardens by the government since 1992 the project tiger project rhino project great indian bustard and many other eco developmental projects have been introduced the 89 national parks 490 wildlife sanctuaries and the zoological gardens 
are set up to take care of natural heritage of India. Let us see the do you know from this chapter. The virgin vegetations which are purely Indian are known as endemic or indigenous species but those which have come from outside India are termed as exotic plants. For example, the coffee or the tea plant term as exotic plants because they have come from outside the India. Those were introduced by Britishers. According to India State Forest Report of 2011, the forest cover in India is 21.05. The Wildlife Protection Act that was implemented in 1970. The Gir Forest is the last remaining habitat of the so the topics in this chapter introduction, size and distribution, India's population distribution by density, population growth, processes of population growth, the age composition, the sex ratio, the literacy rates, occupational structure, health, adolescent population, national population policy of 2000 and the relation between NPP 2000 and adolescent population. So let's start the video. Introduction. Population is the central element in social science. It is the point of reference from which all other elements are being observed. Human beings are producers as well as consumers of the resources. So information about population of a country such as their size, distribution are very important. A census is an official enumeration of population done periodically. In India, the first census was held in the year of 1872. Friends, in India, the census, he census is held after every decade or in 10 years. It is generally held in the first year of the starting year of any decade. The census of India provides us with information regarding the population of our country. The data provided by the census cover below three major questions about the population. They are first population size and distribution. It means how many people are there and where they are located. Second, the population growth and processes of population change. Means how has the population grown and changed throughout the time. The last is characteristics or qualities of the population. It means what are their age, sex composition, their literacy levels, their occupations and the health conditions of population. The first topic is size and distribution. As per March 2001, India's population stood at 1028 million, which account for 16.7% of world's total population. This population is unevenly distributed over country's vast area of 3.28 million square kilometers, which accounts for 2.4% of world's area. Friends, India has 2.4% of world's total area, but has the population of 16.7% of world's total population. It means only 2.4% of area is carrying 16.7% of population. According to the data, UP is the most populous state of India with a population size of 166 million, which account for 16% of total India's population. The Sikkim, Sikkim's population is 0.5 million or 5 lakhs, while the Lakshadweep has only 60,000 people. The five states that is UP, Maharashtra, Bihar, West Bengal and Andhra Pradesh holds almost half of the Indian population according to the census of March 2001. The next topic is India's population distribution by density. Friends, population density is calculated as the number of persons per unit area, that means per square kilometer. The population density of India in the year 2001 was 324 persons per square kilometer, making it one of the most densely populated countries of the world. Densities vary from 904 persons per square kilometer in the West Bengal state to only 13% persons per square kilometer in the Arunachal Pradesh, which is the eastern state of India. The reason for scarce population in some states like Arunachal Pradesh, Meghalaya, Odisha, etc. are rugged terrain and unfavorable climatic conditions. Hilly, dissected and rocky nature of terrains, moderate to low rainfall, shallow or less fertile soils have influenced the population in Assam and the most of the peninsular states. The northern plains and Kerala in the south have high to very high population densities because of the flat plains with fertile soils and abundant rainfall. Yes, friends, we know that in the northern plains there are perennial rivers, means they carry water for all the 12 months, so water is available. Also, the soil available there is 
alluvial soil which is very fertile and the land is plain and those are very good conditions to flourish the population of human being let us look at the india's map of population density you can see the dark color in the northern states like up bihar and also as well as in west bengal and the heart of in india that is delhi so they have carrying the high population density on the other hand there is a faint color in the states like jnk sikkim arunachal pradesh and other northeastern states it implies the conditions in those states are not suitable for human beings it means they have mountains they have jungles there is undulating topography in accessible areas hilly regions that's why the population density of such states is very less next topic is population growth the population growth refers to the change in the number of inhabitants of a country or territory during a specific period of time say during the decade or 10 years the change can be expressed in two ways in terms of absolute number and in terms of percentage change per year the absolute number is calculated by simply subtracting the earlier population from the later population for example the population is subtracted from the the population of 2001 will be subtracted from the population of 1990 to get the absolute number it is referred to as the absolute increase the second way the rate of population is studied in percent per annum example rate of increase of 2% per annum means that in a given year there was an increase of 2% for every 100 persons in the base population this is referred to as the annual growth rate in percentage india's population has been steadily increasing from 361 million in 1951 to 1028 million in 2001 means we have grown three times in just 50 years since 1981 however the rate of growth started declining gradually as birth rates decline rapidly but india has a very large population so when a low annual rate is applied to a very large population it is a large absolute increase for example the 10% of the number 50 is 5 but when you calculate the 1% of the number 1000 it gives you 10 so this is the case with india because we have a large base of population and the small percentage increase yields more absolute number at this growth rate india may overtake china that is our neighbor in 2045 to become the most populous country in the world and that is not a good thing to go on the top so in the following chart you can see every decade the india's population is been increasing and it also gives you absolute increase as well as the annual growth rate in percentage the processes of population change or growth so friends there are three main processes of change of population they are birth rate death rate and migration let's see them one by one the birth rate it is the number of live births per 1000 persons in a year in india birth rates have always been higher than the death rates death rate it is the number of deaths per 1000 persons in a year in india there is rapid decline in the death rates which is the main cause of growth of the indian population due to good medical facilities till 1980 high birth rates are and declining death rates resulted in high rate of population growth but since 1981 birth rates have also started declining gradually due to the awareness resulting in the gradual decline in the rate of population growth but that decline is very gradual third factor is migration it is the movement of people across region or the territories within country or in between other countries this can be internal that means within country or the international that means between the two countries internal migration does not change the size of population but changes the distribution of population within the nation for example if some people from bihar settle at mumbai then the country's population that is the population of india will be same because bihar and mumbai are both are part of india but some persons of delhi settle in the moscow that is in russia then that migration will be international and it will affect the total population of the country in india most migrations have been from rural to urban areas because of adverse condition of poverty and unemployment in the rural areas 
and increased employment opportunities and better living conditions in the city. So what are the effects of migration? It changes the population size. Of course, it will increase one population in one part of the country. On the other hand, it will decrease the population of the other part of the country. It also changes the population composition of urban and rural population in terms of age and sex composition. In India, the rural urban migration has resulted in a steady increase in the percentage of population in the cities and towns. Hence, the cities are carrying the burden of population in India. The age composition. The age composition of a population refers to the number of people in different age groups in a country. The number and percentage of population found within the children, working age and age groups are notable determinants of the population, social and economic structures. So, the population of country can be grouped into the three categories. Those three categories are children, working age and age. First, children. Those are below 15 years. These are economically unproductive, need to be provided with food, clothing, education and medical care. They comprise the 34.4% of total India's population. Second group is working age or productive age. In between 15 to 59 years. These are economically productive and biologically reproductive. Consi they are considered as the working population. They comprise the 58.7% of total India's population. Hence, India is known as the young country. Third part is age, means above 59 years. They can be economically productive, though they may have been retired. They may be working, but they are not available for employment through the recruitment due to the retirement. They comprise the 6.9% of total India's population. In this pie chart, you can see the major part of Indian population is adults, that means working group. Those are 58.7%. That is why India is term as the young country in the world. But we are not getting the benefit of this more number of younger people due to the lack, lack of education or lack of unemployment. Next topic is sex ratio. The sex ratio is defined as the number of females per thousand males in the population. What is the importance of this sex ratio? It measures the extent of equality between males and females in a society at a given time. In India, sex ratio has always remained unfavorable to females. That means the female num number is always less than the male number in Indian society. You can see in the following chart the census year and the sex ratio. Friends, the sex ratio of India never gone beyond 950 forget about 1000 never gone beyond the 950 means for 1000 males the number of females is always less than 950 in indian society literacy rates according to the census of 2001 a person aged 7 years and ago who can read and write with understanding in any language is treated as literate person the low levels of literacy are a serious obstacle for economic improvement. The literacy rate in the country as per the census of 2001 is 64.84%. It means the 65 persons of total 100 persons are literate. The males are, the literacy rate for male is 75.26% while for female it is only 53.67% due to the orthodox society culture in India. The next topic is the occupational structure. The distribution of population according to the different types of occupation is referred to as the occupational structure. The occupations are generally classified into the three categories. Those three are primary, secondary and tertiary. The primary activities are related to the activities on land. It includes agriculture, animal husbandry, forestry, fishing, mining and quarry. The secondary activities which are related to industry or the manufacturing. Those include the industry, building and construction work, etc. The tertiary activity generally related to the services. It includes the transport, communication, commerce, administration and the other service like call centers or IT companies. The developed nations have a high proportion of people in secondary and tertiary activities while the developing nations like India have a higher proportion of their workforce engaged in the primary activities mainly in the agriculture. In India, about 64% of the population is engaged only in the agriculture, that is according to the census of 2001. 
13% are dependent on the secondary while 20% are on the tertiary sectors. Next topic is health. Health is an important component of population composition which affects the process of development. There has been a significant improvement in health conditions in India. The death rates have declined from 25 per thousand population in 1951 to just 8.1 per thousand in 2001. And life expectancy at birth has increased from 36.7 years in 1951 to 64.6 years in 2001. These improvements are due to these following reasons. First, the improvement in public health. Second, the prevention of infectious diseases. And the third, application of modern medical practices in diagnosis and treatment of ailments. The health is still a major concern for India because the per capita calorie consumption is much lower than the recommended level, levels and the malnutrition affects a large percentage of our population. Safe drinking water and basic sanitation amenities are available to only one third of the rural population, means 67% of the rural population are lacking the safe drinking water and basic sanitation amenities. Adolescent population The age group of 10 to 19 years or the teenagers are considered as the adolescent population. It constitutes the one-fifth of the total population of India, means nearly 20%. They are most important future resource for any country. Nutrition requirements of adolescents are higher than those of a normal child or adult because they are in the growing age. In India, the diet available to adolescents is inadequate in all the nutrients. A large number of adolescent girls suffer from the anime, which is the deficiency of RBCs or hemoglobin. The awareness can be improved through the spread of literacy and education among the adolescent girls. The National Population Policy of 2000 or NPP 2000 The Government of India initiated the Comprehensive Family Plan Planning Program in 1950 for improving the individual health and welfare. It sought to promote responsible and planned parenthood on a voluntary basis. The NPP 2000 is the peak of years of planned efforts. So what are the aims of NPP? First, it provides a policy framework for imparting free and compulsory school education up to 14 years of age to all the children. Second, it, reduce, it reduces infant mortality rate to below 30 per thousand live births. Third, it aims at achieving the universal immunization of children against all the vaccine preventable diseases and promoting the delayed marriage for girls. Fourth, it, it aims at making family welfare a people-centered program. So let us see the relation between NPP 2000 and adolescent population. The NPP 2000 identified adolescent as one of the major sections of the population that need greater attention. Besides nutrition, nutritional requirements, the policy put greater emphasis on other important needs of adolescents including the protection from unwanted pregnancies and the sexually transmitted diseases or STDs. The program started by NPP 2000 for adolescents aims at encouraging the delayed marriage and childbearing, the education of adolescents about the risk of unprotected sex and that topics are also included in the science syllabus, making contraceptive services accessible and affordable to all, providing food supplements and nutritional services, strengthening the legal measures to prevent the child marriage. For example, we have the act like prevention of child marriage act. So let us see the do we know from this chapter. Only Bangladesh and Japan have higher average population densities than India. So Kerala has a sex ratio of 1058 females per 1000 males. Means the sex ratio of Kerala is favorable for females. Pondicherry has 1001 females for every 1000 males. While Delhi has only 821 females per 1000 males. Very poor. And Haryana has just 861 females per 1000 minutes. Friends, the movie of Dangal, you will get to know what is the condition of our uh, sisters in Haryana because they are living in very orthodox societies and the birth of a girl child is not celebrated in most of most parts of the Haryana. But at the same time, on the other hand, uh, the the girls of Haryana made India proud in most of the events. For example, uh, 
if you know about the foga sister or the manushi chiller uh, she was miss world i think society should give more freedom to all the girls in our country and definitely they will contribute to make our nation proud so thank you guys this was the end of our ninth ncert geography series so do like share and subscribe this channel if you have any suggestion please drop it in the comment box jai hind